Good morning. Good to see all of you here again this morning. That's awesome. We've had, uh, you know, for July, not too bad. I mean, it's good to see you. Prayers for, ba- uh, prayers for Barb and Don Files. Barb just called me, said they were in an auto accident on the way here. I know. She says they're okay, but they won't be here. So prayers for them. Yes. Lots of announcements. You got your pencils and paper ready. Here we go. We are taking food donations for Goshen United Methodist Church. As you know, Goshen got hit by some tornadoes. And so we're doing it just this weekend. If you don't have, if you didn't bring food, that's okay. Harry's got an envelope. He's going to pass around. If you want to make a love offering, him and Stephanie are going to go shopping this afternoon. They're going to clear out the shelves at Sam's Club. And they're going to drive down to Goshen and deliver that food. So uh, you have an opportunity to help out Goshen if you want to do that. I've had some people ask about hands-on help down there. If they need help, people to come down there, go down there and uh, clean up. Right now, they're replacing about 100 utility poles. So they don't, they don't want a whole bunch of people down there. But this next week, I'm waiting for any news. If they need more help, I may get the word out. And if we want to send a, a group of people down to help, we can do that. Uh, but I will wait to hear word on that. So sometimes the rush of people wanting to help creates more confusion than good. So... We want to do it in the right way. The administrative council meeting and the finance meeting tomorrow is canceled. And then next week, Pastor Amy Haynes will be here to lead lead you in worship. This will be the third segment of our Bicentennial Sermon Series. Uh, So she'll be leading worship next week. After the Saturday service, there's going to be a meal. So if you want to fellowship uh, with her and and the rest of the congregation, you can do that after the Saturday service next week. In one, two, three weeks, so Pastor Amy next week, then you'll have me after that. The week after that, the youth will be leading the worship. They're going to be sharing what they learned on their mission trip. So uh, looking forward to hearing from the kids and from Brian and Jen to see all that they learned, learned down there. Brian's already shared some things with me, and boy, what a trip. He was very impressed by the trip. So, uh, so uh, look forward to hearing from them. Ready? Are you ready? Wait, you haven't seen the best part. There we go. You got it. You're getting it. We're selling these things for, to commemorate our bicentennial. Um, any money we make is going to go towards September 18th. September 18th will be a big day. We're doing one great big worship service outside underneath a big tent. We're going to have lunch afterwards, and I just got some good news. Jack, Jack's so excited, he's jumping up and down. The bishop is coming to preach. So the bishop's going to be here. Yeah, I can't wait. I like hearing him preach. He's very good. Um, so yeah, so there's the news on that. You'll get more details later. Um, the Bicentennial Committee is working very hard on that. Uh, so we'll have more details as we cl- get closer, but we're not too far away. It's two months away. So anyway, Vacation Bible School is uh, coming. And so we're always looking for help with that. Kim Croson is nervous and excited at the same time. Have you ever seen Kim Croson nervous and excited at the same time? Some of you have. It's quite a treat. Yeah. But Vacation Bible School is a big deal. This room will be transformed. And uh, Pastor Amy knows all about that. So she won't be shocked, you know, if if, if there's some decorations already up by the time she gets here. Uh, rummage sale has been scheduled. Some of you have been asking about the rummage sale. Uh, the rummage sale will be August 5th and 6th. Uh, that's that's the, the sale that the youth do to help raise money for their mission trips. Uh, if you have anything you want picked up, you, you can let the office know or let Brian Schleiss know. Um, they can come and get it. But August 5th and 6th, 8 in the morning to, to noon each day will be the rummage sale. Also, and finally is recipes. The Women in Faith group is doing a recipe book uh, to uh, kind of be part of the bicentennial celebration. If you have recipes you want in that book, there's a basket in the back. We'll have it in the the back for a few weeks. Write write your recipes down, put it in the basket, or you can contact Mary. Mary is in the back talking to Jack, uh, and Jack is very vehement on whatever they're talking about. (laughs) But you can, you can get the recipes to Mary. Okay. He's pounding the table even. I don't know what that means. I don't, know, think, I don't think I want to know. 
All right. There are prayer slips in the pews in front of you, and fill out the pew pads. That would be great as well. Helps us stay connected to one another. That said, let us stand and join together. Oh, by the way, everyone, hi on Facebook, hi on YouTube. Uh, I'm glad you're joining with us online, and, um, and uh, welcome, welcome. Let's stand and join together as we uh, participate in a prayer of confession and pardon. When we do not listen to your voice in the depths of our own hearts, calling us to love and forgive. When we do not listen to your voice in our common life, calling us to welcome the stranger and create community. When we do not listen to your voice in our world, calling us to work for justice and to make peace. The word is very near to us, in our hearts and on our lips. In Christ we are forgiven, our lives are made new, and our future of hope is restored. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's join together in our opening song. Our reading today is from Deuteronomy 30, 11, 14. Surely, this commandment that I am commanding you today is not too hard for you, nor is it too far away. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven for us and get it for us so that we may hear it and observe it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross to the other side of the sea for us? and get it for us, so that we may hear it and observe it. No, the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart for you to observe. Let's bow for a word of prayer. God, we... Uh... We do invite you into our midst, not only as your word is spoken, but also as your word is proclaimed. Uh, help us listen, help us learn, and help us apply our learnings uh, on this day. In your son's name, amen. All right. Well, I feel weird because the choir is supposed to sing and I... I'm going to go right into my sermon. Is that okay? I mean, this might mean you get out a little early. Is anybody upset by that? 
Not a, not a single person's upset about that. Right. Okay. Um, did you know that you have great potential for doing a lot of good? You have great potential for doing a lot of good. Every single one of you. And sometimes you do it. No? We're helping out Goshen. The moment has come. We do a lot of good. Um, But sometimes you have great potential for doing a lot of good, and we don't do it. And there's reasons why we don't do it. In fact, we come up with a lot of creative reasons about those moments when we don't do a lot of good, when we could be doing a lot of good. Um, Now, I say reasons. That's the nice word. The not so nice word is what? Excuses. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you help me out because you have, you have a wonderful list of excuses. And I want to hear some of your excuses of why you don't do good when you have a chance to do good. What are some of your excuses? Go. Too busy. Too busy. Too tired. Too tired. Too poor. Too poor. <laughs> if I just had more money, I could do a lot more good. Man, do you know how much good I could do if I won the lottery? Wow, I could do a lot of good. But I haven't won the lottery, so I guess I won't. What else? Too afraid. All right. Too busy, too poor, too tired, too afraid. Too lazy. lazy. Someone else's job. Boy, do I hear that one a lot. So I don't hear that someone else's job. I hear... That's your job. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll get to that later. Don't know, how. don't know how. Did you read my sermon this morning? No, you didn't? Okay. Okay. Those are all good ones. Someone else will do it. Yeah. All right. Well, that's a good list. That's a good list. Um, but, but we are good, and sometimes we are creative at creating... You can say reasons, you can say excuses. I also use the word barriers. We, we place barriers up that give us reasons why not to do good when we have a chance to do good. And some of the excuses we give date way back. Some of the excuses we give date way back. In fact, some excuses are so popular, they date all the way back to Old Testament times. And so what I want to do is I want to talk about two of those excuses that we use so that we can move them out of our way and look at how God can empower us and equip us to to live into the potential for doing a lot of good. Because every single one of you have a lot of potential to do a lot of good. Amen? Amen. Yeah. So if you read the scripture, sorry, Daniel, I'm I'm, 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 I'm juking. Um, One of the questions was, Who's going to go to heaven to find out what we're supposed to do? That that was in the scripture, something to that effect. Well, you don't have to go to heaven to find out what you're going to do, but we use that as an excuse. But we word it differently, okay? Um, And the way we word it is, well, I don't do that because, I I didn't do a lot of good because no one told me to. Does Does any of you sit back and wait to be told to do something before you do it? Because that is a habit of some. And that habit goes way back as well. Um, all the way back to Moses. You know, when Moses freed the slaves from Egypt, they sat around, they waited for him to tell them what to do. He said, hey, we're just going to cross that sea. Don't worry, the water's going to part. We're going to go right across it. Well, okay, Moses. And Moses said, hey, you no, know, gather food in the morning, but don't gather food in the evening. Okay, Moses. And then Moses said, hey, I'm going to go up to the mountain, and I'm going to come back and tell you what to do. Okay, Moses. So Moses goes up on the mountain, and while Moses is on the mountain, Aaron gets up and says, hey, let's make a golden calf. And you said, okay, Aaron. And so you made a golden calf. Then Moses comes down, sees that you made a golden calf. He's all mad. He breaks the tablets. And now what? Now you don't know what to do. So you've got to wait for Moses to go back up on the mountain to get the commandments to come back down. So, so they got in the habit early on of just waiting around, waiting for their leader to tell them what to do. And so the popular excuse evolved into, well, I don't do any good because no one's told me what to do yet. 
Now, it just wasn't true for Moses. That was true in the book of Joshua. That was true for King Solomon. That was true for King David. That was true for the priests of the temple. We all waited for the powers, of be, the powers that be to tell us what to do. And if they don't tell us what to do, then we don't do it. <clears throat> we carry on that tradition today. today. I haven't been told what to do yet. Look at the historic Catholic Church before Protestantism. Think about the historic Catholic Church. How did you figure out how to live your life in the olden days? You go to the cathedral and you listen to the priest. Don't worry, the priest will tell you what to do. Well, Martin Luther got tired of that idea. And so he left the Catholic Church. But even today, in Protestant churches, we have, we have very uh, evangelical, um, what's the word? We have very evangelical um, branches of the Protestant church that are in the habit of waiting to be told what to do. You know, the preacher will tell us what to do, and then we'll go do it. Do you understand how dangerous that is? First of all, do you know how dangerous it would be if you relied on me to tell you what to do? That's dangerous. But you also recognize what a short walk it is from being the kind of community of faith that waits to be told what to do and a cult. You know what a cult is, right? A cult is a group of people that decide, hey, Joe knows what he's talking about. Let's just listen to him, and whatever he says, we're going to go do it. Now, I'm not gonna, I wouldn't complain about that. I think that would be a lot of fun if you listened to everything I said. But that's the short walk between being a church that looks up to their leaders and being a cult. At the root of this idea is the idea that the designated leader, whoever the designated leader is, somehow knows better than you. As if it, this person is somehow higher in authority or power or whatever, whether it's a prophet or a king or a priest or a self-proclaimed messenger of God. I mean, how do you think? The whole David Koresh situation took place. It, they, they took that short walk. Um, now, it's easy for you if you take that approach, right? Because if all you do is you do what you're told, then you have no responsibility in it, do you? Because you're just doing what you're told. Uh, boy, that, that makes it easy. And if, if, if you're right or you're wrong, it doesn't matter because you're just being told to do it. So it's not you messing up, it's me messing up. Yeah, I don't go for that. The approach created is a perfect excuse, not just for churches, but especially for kids. When I was a kid, I used this excuse a lot. No one told me to do it. Joe, why didn't you help that lady with groceries? No one told me to do that. Joe, why didn't you hold that door for the gentleman? I'm sorry, no one told me to do that. Joe, why didn't you clean your room? No one told me to do that. Yes, I did, five times. <laughs> I don't know how old I was, but eventually that excuse stopped working. When mom finally said, you know what, use your brain. You know what you're supposed to do, just go do it. The word is very near you. It is on your lips, it is in your heart, so that you may obey it. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus well? Then you already know what good is. Just go do it. The potential to do a lot of good is within you. You don't need the approval of a prophet or a king or a priest or a pastor to do something good. Do you know Jesus? Then you know what good means, go do it. This is the United Methodist Church. And here's one of the reasons I love the United Methodist Church. The pastor is not in charge. Now I want you to hear me closely on this. In the United Methodist Church, the pastor is not in charge. 
You are in charge. The United Methodist Church, the Methodist Church was a lay movement. A bunch of people got together and said, hey, let's start a church. It wasn't, it wasn't clergy driven. It was lay driven. You know, I, I just work here. You know, that was a joke. And the, and, 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 and the 530 service last night, there was that one single laugh. And I thought, you know what? That's okay. They missed it. It's okay. I got two more chances. So the 9 o'clock service, I said, I just work here. Not one single laugh. Not one. I'm like, okay, one more chance. One more chance. And I, and I said it. And I heard, I think, two chuckles. But I think one was planted. I think. <laughs> Now, here's what I will do as a pastor. I will preach to you. I will teach you. I will nudge you. I will encourage you. I will equip you. I will show you opportunities. I might even come up with a really good idea or two. But if you know Jesus, and you know Jesus well, you don't need me to tell you what to do. Just go do it. Now, you think that might be dangerous. Well, it could be dangerous because if you don't know Jesus well, you might do the wrong things. But we have examples in this church where the late, you who are in charge went and did and do good things. Now, we have an endowment now. That, the endowment where we're, 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 we're saving and we're investing money to help missions, ministry, generations to come. That wasn't my idea. Some of you are under the impression that was my idea. That's not my idea. A lay person came to me and said, hey, I have an idea for an endowment. And, and, and a couple more people heard this idea and they said, oh, that, that, that's a good idea. And we, then we got together and we had a church meeting, not a meeting. We had a church meeting and we said, hey, that's a good idea. All I'm doing is I'm preaching and teaching and, and ta- talking to you about it. That's you. Good for you. Now we've got an endowment up, I think, up around 15000 somewhere, and we're still trying to build it. Goshen Food Drive. Layperson emailed me and said, hey, how can we help with Goshen? And then the, the Goshen, uh, Goshen Church emailed me and said, here's how you can help with Goshen. And so we're helping with Goshen. Not, not my idea. I'm just helping you find ways to help your idea work. It was a celebration on September 18th. Did, did, did you hear the bishops coming? Yeah, if, do me a favor. If he says a joke, could you please laugh at it? <laughs> Thanks. Please, please do that. I'll, laugh, I'll, be the, I'll be laughing the loudest, just so you know. Hope I don't laugh at the wrong time. Youth mission trips, not, not my idea. Outreach events, not really my idea. If the pastor is the one dreaming, and the pastor is the one planning, and the pastor is the one implementing, and the pastor is the one evaluating, what you have is a dying church. I know there, because I've been there. I know it because I've seen it. When the pastor is driving everything, and pushing everything, and doing everything, what you have is a dying church. Right, Doug? Yes. Yes. Here's what I will do. I'll lead worship. I'm even maybe kind of controlling around worship. I don't know. I'll administer the sacraments, baptism, Holy Communion. I'll teach Bible study. I'll lead membership class. But the rest of my time is spent equipping you to go do and live into the potential for doing a lot of good. The word is very near you. It is on your lips. It is in your heart so that you may obey it. And if you know Jesus, and you know Jesus very well, and by the way, if you don't, that's a different sermon, if you don't, but if you don't, you can come talk to me. I'll introduce you to him. He's really nice. But if you already know Jesus, and you know him well, then you already know what to do. Go and do it. So the first excuse is, well, I haven't been told what to do yet. doesn't work. Because we believe in the Holy Spirit that teaches us. Second excuse, you ready? This is, this, is a, this is a better one. I hear this one a lot. By the way, there's a lot going on right now. I mean, there's a lot of chaos right now, right? I mean, we've got the Ukraine war, we've got uh, inflation, um, uh, we've got hot weather. Um, how many of you have 
kids at home, that you're just super busy, got to go and take your kids here and there. Tell you what, let's just let everything calm down. And when everything calms down, then we'll go do a lot of good. Deal? All right. Well, you let me know when things calm down, and then we'll go do a lot of good. See, that's, that's excuse number two. You know, my, my life is just kind of full right now. Um, um, what, hey, I remember. I remember when I had five kids in my house. You think that wasn't chaotic? Kim and I were just talking the other day. We remember when we had to fill two grocery carts full of food. We remember when we had to figure out how to get four, four cookie trays of fish sticks in the oven. <laughs> we remember those days. And, and, and we're reminiscing on those days because now we're just sitting around the house staring at each other. Like, what do we do now? If I had a nickel, Pastor Joe, things are kind of crazy right now. But i tell you what. When things get calmed down, you, I'll come talk to you and we'll get some stuff done. Well, in the scripture, if you remember, there's, there's a question. Who's going to go to heaven and find out what we're going to do? Well, you already know what to do. Who's going to go across the sea and find out what we're, we're supposed to do? Well, if you understand, in the Old Testament times, the sea was a chaotic place. The sea was a dangerous place. No one wanted to go across the sea. And that, and that kind of draws a parallel to us today in terms of our seas. You all have a sea. Does they, who here does not have any drama in their life whatsoever? Do you dare raise your hand? If you, if you wait until the drama or the adversity subsides to do good, you'll never get any good done. There is always something wrong with a person's life. And there's always something wrong with the world. And there's always something wrong with the church. Why, Joe, why didn't you help that lady with groceries? Mom, she looked pretty grumpy. She kind of scared me. I was afraid to ask. Joe, why didn't you hold the door open for that gentleman? Mom, I was late for class. I got things to do. He knows how to open doors. He'll be fine. I got to get to class. Joe, why didn't you clean your room? <coughs> I didn't feel good, Mom. The good that is in you is what is needed now in a world that is full of drama. If the world was a perfect place and the church was a perfect place, there would be no need for you to do any good. Your potential is there for a reason. The world needs it now more than ever. The church needs it now more than ever. And we have two, two examples I want to point out to you. One is in our past and one is in our future. The first one is about COVID. Remember when COVID first hit? When did COVID hit? Spring of 20, is that right? Uh, Terry, Terry Bishop said, was it March 20th, 2020? I think is what she said. She had, she's got the date etched in her head. And you remember when it first hit, all the churches everywhere shut down? I mean, there was nothing going on in any of the churches. Now, I wasn't here then, but I was at Emmanuel then, and when it happened, we shut down entirely. And maybe rightfully so, because our thinking was, yeah, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a disease, and don't worry, a couple weeks it'll be over. Remember thinking that? In a few weeks, we'll get back to normal, Life will be good. Then we can get back to being the church. And one week went past, and two weeks went past. And I don't know about you, every church was a little different. But for us at Emmanuel, after two weeks, I started thinking about a question. Where is the good news needed more? In a world full of COVID or a world without COVID? Where is the good news needed more. And not only was I starting to ask that question, but along the way, lots of pastors and lots of churches were asking that question. The same question in different ways, maybe. But, but what we got was pastors and churches finally realizing, you know what? The world full of COVID needs good news a whole lot more than the world without COVID. We need to figure out how to be the church in a world full of COVID. How do you become a church? How do you become a church when you're not supposed to meet with one another? Well, we got creative. 
What is it? Necessity is the mother of all invention. And you got creative. And you, and you created a seat back there that Matt Perry can sit in, all comfy and stuff. But every church found a way that they survived to be creative about sharing good news in a world full of COVID because a world full of COVID needed good news. See, at first we were going to wait for it to go away. Well, guess what? COVID's not going away. We realized at some point that it wasn't going away. And if you haven't realized it yet, realize it now, COVID's not going away. In fact, I just got an email Last night, you know, Chuck Novak had COVID. He's getting over it. Now Donna's got COVID. And someone told me someone else got, oh, Sandy Ray is dealing with it now. It looks different. It looks different. But it's not going away. Just think what would have happened if we would have just waited until it went away. Adversity, drama, chaos does not excuse you from doing lots of good. In fact, the need for good is even greater. And this church has done it, and you're continuing to do it, yea for you. We want things to be calm so we can focus on doing good, but God wants your goodness to help out, especially in a world that isn't calm. So that your goodness can maybe create little places of calm. You know, where you can just take a breath and think to yourself, wasn't that nice? In fact, maybe you can do that with me. <sighs> Isn't that nice? And then smile when you say it. Don't grumble about it, because the pastor made me say it. Second example, COVID's kind of in our past, but also in our present, probably in our future. But the second example of chaos and drama is this whole bit about the division of the United Methodist Church and this debate around human sexuality. I remember my first annual conference in 1995, 20, what, 27 years ago? And it was my very first annual conference. Boy, I was excited. We're going to talk about, we're going to talk about a lot of good stuff. And I sat in a room filled with about two to 3,000 people and an elderly gentleman stood up and started talking about the, the, this, this problem that we got to deal with right now around human sexuality. We got, we got to deal with it right now. And, and, and there was an extended debate about how we're going to deal with this issue. And I caught on that for some people, this issue was the A number one problem in the church. And we got to figure this out. And until we figure this out, we don't have time to discuss anything else. And so we discussed it for like two hours. 27 years later, hear me, 27 years later, what if I would have been, what if as a young pastor, I would have been all caught up in that? Think of all the good I've tried to do in 27 years, and think about all the good I would not have done over 27 years had I been caught up in that one particular debate. If I would have allowed the difficulties and the drama and the adversity and the chaos and the brokenness of the church to get in my way, what would I have not done over 27 years? See, my take on the splits is this. Here's my take on the church splits. If you've not read my blog, read it. Um, the church splitting is not a, that big of a deal. We'll decide. When the time comes, we'll decide, we'll go, whatever way we go, we go, and, and, and people will have their opinions, and we'll have debates and arguments and maybe hurt feelings. But you have to understand, the church has been doing this for 2,000 years. The, the church hasn't split in our lifetime, so we think this is a big deal. But, but read the history books. Church has been splitting all the time. To, to me, it's not that big of a deal. We, we, we just kind of got to get over ourselves a little bit. Here's the big deal. The big deal is this. In the midst of our brokenness, and the church has always been broken, in the midst of our brokenness, how much good are you going to do? That's the big deal. Because some churches get so caught up, so caught up, they forget to do the good. And so it's going to be intriguing for me to wait and see what happens in, in the congregations 
in our denomination? How many churches get so distracted that they forget to build the kingdom of God and make disciples of Jesus? Those are the churches that won't be very effective in the long run. In the midst of the chaos, how much good are you going to do? Building the kingdom of God in the midst of the brokenness are the churches who will be most effective in the long run. Um, churches that can stay focused on doing good things will be most effective in the long run. Uh, and if you know Jesus, and you know Jesus really well, and I, just, I know some of you do, then you already know what to do. Go do it. So, so my, my, my take on this is this. We're going to stay focused on the main thing. Now, how are we going to stay focused on the main thing? Well, you, 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 some of you know what our, what our focal point is. What's our focal point? If you can say it, you win a million dollars. What's our focal point? How, where do you go to find our focal point? Jesus, okay, but specifically in this church, Matt wants the, Matt wants the million dollars, but you were here last service, I don't count. The, who, who says you're chart? You're late, we'll beat you. Well, were you just, what'd you just do? Did you just stick your tongue out at him? Oh, okay, because I was going to take the million dollars away from you. Oh, okay, all right. Well, you see Kevin Hauser. You know who Kevin Hauser is? He's our treasurer. He will write you out a check for a million dollars, okay? But before he gives it to you, he's going to write big V-O-I-D on it. And then you can have it, okay? All right, he's excited. All right, good. All right. It's in the bulletin for a reason every week. And it's to help us to stay focused on what we're supposed to be doing, even in the midst of our brokenness. And, and what I'm saying is, that's okay. In fact, I would say God wants us to especially be focused in the midst of our brokenness. And by the way, the church is always broken. There's always something wrong with the church. And we can sit down and we can talk about every meeting or meeting, what's wrong with the church, or we can sit down and talk about how are we going to do the most good that we can do in the midst of our brokenness. Those are the two choices that ch congregations will be making. And like I said, it'll be intriguing to see which churches make it through and which churches don't. And it's not about the splitting or not splitting part. It's about how you be an effective congregation. There will be churches that split that, that will be effective congregations. And there will be a churches who don't split that will be effective congregations. My prayer for you is that you live into your potential for doing good things. And if you know Jesus, you know what those good things are. We're, 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 in the, in the ha we're in the process now of creating a group of people that want to sit around the table and just talk about what it would mean to, to live into the potential for doing good things. We've already got a group of people of, I don't know, eight or nine or so are in the group now. If you want to be a part of that group, let me know. If you are a person who likes to sit around the table and just talk about what ifs, like in a good way, and just talk about dreams in a good way, this group's for you. Let me know, and I'll add you to the list. End of August, sometime in the middle of September, we're going to have that meeting. And we're going to sit around the table, and we're just going to dream what ifs. Okay? Okay. I'm excited. Some of you are now, too. Some. But may your focus remain on the Christ. May your focus remain on the goodness that may continue to get done. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, the joys I feel, the bliss I share of those whose anxious spirits burn with strong desires for thy return. With such I hasten to the place where God my Savior shows his face and gladly take my station there and wait for thee, sweet hour of prayer.
joys and concerns. The concerns first. Uh, from Susan Rahala, friends Tim Penner and Mary Grimes, both, de- both dealing with cancer. Prayers for them. Uh, from Doug Dean, safe travels. Jeff Dean and family as they move their daughter Katie to Denver, Colorado today and tomorrow. Exciting, Denver, Colorado. Um, from Christy Shetterly, baby Charlie is recovering from a broken collarbone. Uh, got that at birth. Uh, I've heard that before. Sometimes it happens. Um, and also battling reflux issues, so prayers for him. Also family and friends of Bernie Pernell, Pernell who passed away this week. Um, from, Ar- um, let's see. from Arlene Brown, a co-worker, Andre Tram, major spine surgery this week. From Kim Perry, Laura, Laura Lee, a four-month-old baby that has a fractured skull. <coughs> um, but they feel like uh, she'll be okay. She was sent home from the hospital with a neck brace, and she will heal. So prayers for them. Barb Mills, David Willis, recovering from surgery. Howard Kelly, facing a third surgery for kidney stones. Neighbor Debbie Tibbs, another surgery this week on left shoulder damage in an auto accident over a year ago. So I guess this is the week for surgeries. I don't know. Did I mention, I mentioned Don and Barb, right? Files, prayers for them, that they're okay in their auto accident. From Linda Lee's cousin Judy DeWitt, she fell at home. It took two hours for someone to find her. Uh, but they found her, and she's, doing, she's home from the hospital now, and she's praising God because God watched over her during that time. So prayers for her. For Mary and Ron Fogel, uh, Mary's dad's wife has just been diagnosed with cancer and is, ha- is having surgery in the next week or so. Um... Praise, praise, praise. Other concerns. Uh, I mentioned Donna Novak. Donna, if you're watching, we're praying for you with COVID. Also, Sandy Ray, if you're watching, prayers for you. Prayers for Patty Hammett. Pat, Patty might be watching too. Uh, Patty's been through it. She's got an infection, but she's at home now and still in IVs, though, I think. So, prayers for her. Uh, prayers for, I, I, I hope I got this right. I think it's Kaylee. It's Amanda Spellman's daughter, oldest. She's having surgery this week. So, prayers for Kaylee. And Will wanted me to pray for Yosemite. Wildfires, right, Will? All right, prayers for Yosemite. Is that Yosemite? Is that the place that had also had the floods? Yeah, a couple years ago. A couple years ago, I thought there were. Which is a national park that had floods this past spring? Yellowstone. Yellowstone. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So prayers for Yosemite, or as I used to say, Yosemite. All right. <laughs> Praises, you ready for praises? Doug Dean, praises, thanks for a glorious wedding of our grandson Jacob. Thanks for a superb concert where our daughter Sarah sang. Toledo Choral Society, 100th year anniversary. All right, good for her. Praise from Sally Stroll. Hi, Sally, good to see you. This is her second week back. Uh, Thank you, this congregation, for all the prayers and cards and support during my knee replacement surgery and recovery. All right, glad you're here, Sally. Whenever you're ready to race around the building, you let me know. All right, well, I'll win. Okay, all right. And then from Arlene Brown, a joy, uh, her niece had a baby girl, Lily, this Thursday. Uh, did, did, did I tell you the news? The bishop's coming, September 18th? Yes. Okay, you heard? Okay, good. So with those prayers and concerns in our hearts, let us uh, bow our heads for prayer. Lord, we thank you for all the good that you have done for us. We thank you for living into your potential for goodness and for allowing us not just to see it, uh, to, but to be a church that reflects it to the world. Help us live into our potential for doing lots of good. It is not always easy, God. Sometimes it is very difficult. Um, We live in a kind of world that is so easily distracted. We find many people during our day who are sad, who are angry, uh, where priorities are misplaced, 
And it is easy for us, O oh God, to be distracted by such. So let us live into our potential for doing lots of good and can continue to show such good in such a drama-filled world. Lord, it is not just a world that can be distracted, but it is your church that can be distracted. Your church is filled with people, and there are so many opinions and thoughts and beliefs. There are so many different kinds of feelings. We think different ways. We experience life different ways. Help us live into the potential for doing lots of good. And so, God, even in the midst of a church that is never perfect, in the midst of a church that is often broken in many different ways, help us continue to do the sorts of things that Jesus would have us do, to love our neighbor, to worship you with all that we have, and to make disciples in Jesus' name. Help us live into our potential for doing lots of good. It is not always easy, oh God. Our lives, our personal lives are filled, often filled with drama. We have dysfunctions in our families. We have addictions in our families. We have unemployment and illness. And evidently this week we have lots of surgeries. Help us live into our potential for doing lots of good. Even in the midst of our lives that are filled with busyness and drama. And so God, continue to empower and equip us as your church. Help us stay focused on building your kingdom, uh, that good might happen, and that more and more people, indeed the entire world, may come to know you through Jesus Christ. We praise you and we thank you in the name of the Christ, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Each one of you have great potential to do a lot of good. Go and do a lot of good. Go in peace. Amen? Amen. Amen.